The autopsy. The dead man lay, alone and naked, on a white table in the large room, amid the oppressive whiteness, the cruel austerity of the operating theater, which still seemed to tremble with the screams of unending torments. The midday sun was spread over him like a sheet, awakening the cadaveric lividity of his forehead. It conjured a bright green from his belly, blowing it up like a huge water bag. His body resembled the gigantic, iridescent cup of a mysterious flower from the Indian jungle, which someone had shyly laid beside the altar of death. Magnificent blues and reds grew along his loins, and in the heat, the great wound below his navel slowly burst like a red furrow, giving off a dreadful odor. The doctors entered. Two amiable men in white coats and gold pince nez, with the dueling scars of the student fraternities. They went over to the dead man and looked at him with interest, discussing medical matters. Out of the white cupboards, they took their dissecting instruments white boxes full of hammers, bone saws with strong teeth, files, horrible cases full of forceps, little holders full of huge needles which looked like curved vultures' beaks, eternally screaming for flesh. They began their horrible task. They resembled hideous torturers. The blood streamed over their hands, and they thrust them even farther into the cold corpse and took out the contents, like white cooks drawing a goose. The intestines twisted themselves round their arms like yellowish green snakes, and the feces dribbled down their coats, a warm, putrid liquid. They slid open the bladder. Inside, the urine shimmered like yellow wine. They poured it out into great bowls. It had a pungent, acrid smell like ammoniac. But the dead man slept on. Patiently, he allowed himself to be tugged this way and that, to be dragged by the hair this way and that. He slept on. And as the hammer blows thundered against his head, a dream, one last scrap of love, awoke within him, like a torch shining out into his darkness. Outside the window, a huge broad sky opened up, filled with little white clouds floating in the light, in the quiet of the afternoon, like little white gods. And the swallow circled high up in the blue, quivering in the warm July sun. The black blood of death ran over the blue decay of his forehead. In the heat, it evaporated to form a ghastly cloud, and the decomposition of death crept over him with its colorful claws. His skin began to disintegrate. His belly turned white, like that of an eel, under the greedy fingers of the doctors, who bathed their arms up to the elbows in the moist flesh. Decomposition drew the dead man's mouth apart. He seemed to be smiling. He was dreaming of a happy star, of a fragrant summer's evening. His liquescent lips quivered, as if at a fleeting kiss. How I love you! I have loved you so much. Shall I tell you how much I love you? The way you walked through the poppy field, a fragrant poppy flame yourself. You had drunk in the whole evening, and your dress, billowing round your ankles, was a wave of fire in the setting sun. But your head was inclined in the light, and your hair was still burning, still ablaze from all my kisses. So you walked and kept on turning round to look back at me, and for a long time the lantern in your hand still swayed like a glowing rose in the twilight. I will see you again tomorrow, here below the window of the chapel, here where the light of the candles falls down, turning your hair into a forest of gold, here where the narcissi rub their heads against your ankles tenderly like delicate kisses. I will see you again. Every evening at the hour of twilight, we will never leave each other. How I love you! Shall I tell you how much I love you? And the dead man quivered gently with bliss on his white mortuary table as the metal chisels in the hands of the doctors broke open the bones of his temples.